Well, okay. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to today's dev call about uh, what's next, what's going on with BISC, where would BISC go, where we want it to go. Um, there are quite a few people here that uh, have visions of what BISC should be and what it is right now and what's not ideal about it and where we could improve stuff. Um, Today's dev core would be something like a presentation, I guess, less of a discussion. Uh, the goal is to uh, get people up to speed what is being worked on uh, and what is the future of BISC in terms of what features can we expect, which, which features will um, fade away. Uh, of course, any, any uh, ideas and comments are uh, welcome. Um, well, uh, let's start with, uh, there has been discussion of a new trade protocol for a long time now, and it seems that finally something is getting done. Um, and then there is uh, this topic of BISC version two out there, where yet another new trade protocol is in the making, or at least is thought about, uh, where uh, BISC itself doesn't have uh, a Bitcoin wallet integrated into the BISC software anymore. And uh, the, the trades are done off chain. So <clears throat> it should have a few, a few um, actually many advantages over the current uh, architecture. But um, yeah, let's start. Uh, Manfred, would you be so kind to uh, lose a few words on the new trade protocol? Yeah, um, I try to make it as short as possible. That's not my talent. Of usually, course. <laughs> and uh, feel free to just interrupt me so <clears throat> that it doesn't turn to a completely monologue. So there are, as Florian mentioned, there are two uh, trade protocol ideas out. Uh, one is already quite old. Also the other the option trade protocol the idea was created a year ago but basically about it was completely on hold and just recently we were diving deeper into it again and they are basically very different so, uh, let's call the one the new trade protocol in lack of a better name and the other one is the off-chain trade protocol so i start with the, talking about the new trade protocol <coughs> that's actually planned now for the next release that will be 1.2 version 1.2 it will be a semi hard fork, or so not a hard hard fork, but uh, users need to update to be able to trade. Uh, also, all not updated clients cannot trade with new users. But beside that, there's not too much interruption uh, with the network. <coughs> and uh, it changes basically quite, um, yeah, quite strongly the current trade protocol. The current trade protocol is based on this two of three multisig, where the arbitrator is the third key holder. And that is a ma major problem. <coughs> the arbitrator is basically a kind of like a trusted third party. And it will hinder us to scale up and to be censorship resistant uh, for um, various just reasons. Just to interrupt you, uh, what, what, does the, uh, what is the arbitrator role? Is there, is there uh, on, on every trade, does the arbitrator have to do something or no. just in case? No, no. Uh, the, uh, when there's a normal trade where no problem is, then the traders are executing uh, that trade without involvement of the arbitrate, then the arbitrate is not aware of the trade. But he has provided the third key for the uh, multisig. And that's already a problem. <coughs> Only when there is a dispute, then yeah, they are starting to chat with the arbitrate, that arbitrate to get all the trade information, the contract, and can see all the names and everything. So it's a privacy issue, of course. And uh, <coughs> the arbitrate uh, yeah, tries to resolve the case and He's then creating the pair transaction with one of the two traders, usually with the one who should get the money out or the, the big amount of the money. Okay, so, uh, so, so instead of the, the second trader in, included in the multisig approach, yeah. the, the arbitrator is the second exactly. one to sign the, yeah. the trade. Okay. Yeah. And <clears throat> yeah, uh, and we have yeah, we have basically three problems here. One is a legal risk <coughs> that the arbitrate has no clear definition, doesn't exist really in real life, the same model with a two or three multisig, but it could be interpreted as financial intermediary according to some laws in some countries, the open gray area, but there is a certain amount of risk there. Uh, 
Then the second is that there's a security risk when the arbitrator get hacked or when the arbitrator would be rouge, she could basically steal funds. <clears throat> And the third is, uh, and because of this, we cannot scale it up. We cannot make it uh, that anonymous people can become arbitrator. It's a trusted role, and that's also why it's a bonded role. I mean, we, are, we have not enforced the bond so far because we basically want to get rid of it anyway. But uh, even the bond would not be enough because the amount that could be theoretically stolen will always be higher. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the, we cannot we enforce that the arbitrator need to pay half a million of BSQ in bond or whatever, then nobody will do it. Another thing is that it's very expensive. The arbitrator, yeah, because he carries the legal risk, because he carries the <coughs> the risk that when his uh, applic yeah, when he get hacked and his key is stolen, that it will be a, a security risk. And <coughs> another uh, risk, which is not very, uh, people are not very familiar, but which is very important is, and which is the reason why we have also a trade limit for altcoins, even there is no security risk, <coughs> uh, is because when the arbitrator makes a mystic at the payout, he thinks that yeah, the buyer should get the money and he clicks by a mystic on the seller basically and gives the seller, seller the money, then he has to pay the damage from his own pocket. The buyer will complain then and yeah, when the seller is not honest and return the money, the arbitrator has to pay this and that recently happened. It happened over time, over the last three years, it happened maybe four or five times. Uh, people make mistake, <clears throat> and yeah, when you make this mistake, the money is gone in Bitcoin, there, there is no uh, reversion, of course. And usually, nearly always, the traders were honest and were paying back, <clears throat> but recently, uh, one arbitrator got hit by, by that, and it was a two Bitcoin trade with Monero, so he lost two Bitcoin, which is a lot of money, $20,000, and he, yeah, he, basically lost nearly all the money what he has earned so far. So that's the reason why arbitration is very expensive for the DAO. Usually, at the moment, I think we're spending roughly one Bitcoin per month on one arbitrator. So two Bitcoin basically were running the two arbitrators. And when there would be more trade or more volume, it will be higher. So uh, uh, let, let me just interrupt you. Uh, the, the arbitrator is the one who gets the, the fees. Trade, the trading fee in Bitcoin, yeah. <laughs> Also, okay. before the DAO, it was basically a full trading fee. I think now it's between 60 and 80 percent of the trading fees paid in BSQ. So the arbitrators are not earning so much anymore, but it seems that's still enough. But we want to get uh, to switch this also to this donation address <coughs> that uh, the Bitcoin fee will be paid also directly to this BISC donation address. And then the holder of the donation address, what we have just voted on in this voting cycle, will. Uh, buy BSQ with this Bitcoin and then burn this BSQ and by converting the Bitcoin basically back to BSQ uh, by burning it, it has the same economic uh, function like when the user would have burned uh, the, the trading fee in BSQ as well. It's just a manual process that will come also probably with the next version. <laughs> and I would just wanted to give a little bit because it's not very clear. People love the arbitration system because they're used to it. And most people don't understand and are not aware of the big problems what uh, what, what they carry for the for the project and the big costs. So okay, so <coughs> a, another point is maybe uh, if you if you have someone who wants to attack BISC as a whole, uh, then an arbitrator would be a perfect point of interest. Exactly, for yeah. it's basically attack. our our weakest link in the moment, <coughs> uh, and we yeah we need to get rid of it. It's a long term. Since a long term uh, a goal, uh, but yeah, we never had time to basically work on the solutions. And this new trade protocol is basically the solution to get rid of it. <coughs> and I will, yeah, will uh, describe how it works. It's not, <coughs> as it's in some areas, it's quite similar, but there are some additional areas. So, <coughs> uh, yeah, when you start the trade, uh, you are creating, you make a handshake with the other user where you exchange uh, their transaction data and your and their account data for verifying and everything. And they are now at the current trade protocol, you create the two or three multisig, the deposit transaction, and that get published. And with that, basically the trade has started. And then the next step will be that the buyer need to pay the fee or the altcoin and so on. And I, I'm only talking about this first phase <coughs> where, yeah, what I just said, where the, the trade gets started because the rest doesn't change. All the, the remaining stuff where you have a fear 
gets uh, the fiat payment gets started and then the seller need to confirm that you've received the fiat or the altcoin and then the payout gets created so all that part is exactly the same the only big changes are in this initial part where where the multisig is created and with the new trade protocol something uh, additional <coughs> So instead of a two of three multisig where the arbitrator is a key holder, we are uh, changing now to a two of two multisig. So only the two traders are the key holders. There's no arbitrator included. <coughs> and uh, what we have deployed already now with the version and the mediation will be activated in two days. <coughs> uh, when users have problems, first they can communicate over the trader chat to resolve it by themselves. The tester, uh, advantage for the users that they don't reveal any privacy to a third party. When they cannot uh, reveal it, <coughs> then they can ask for mediation, a set that will be activated in two days. Mediation is basically the same like the arbitration without the key. So the, he's, he's investigating the case, have the, this chat system and everything, and try to find a solution. And But he cannot enforce the solution by making the payout. He only can make a suggestion for the payout. What the mediator thinks is the just payout. And he will send this message to both traders. And both traders get basically uh, the information. Yeah, the mediator suggests the payout with this amount goes to the buyer, this amount goes to the seller. Do you accept or do you reject? When both accept, <coughs> then they are both signing the payout transaction and the trade is closed like in the normal execution. Everything is, is fine. When one of the traders or both uh, reject, <coughs> then uh, we are going uh, to the next level. And there have been a few different ideas, but maybe I skip all this to not confuse you. <coughs> the current, which is very fresh and was just developed yesterday, actually, uh, idea is that you, are, you have two options then. Also when you are rejecting uh, this uh, recommended payout from the mediator, <coughs> you can, uh, or wait, uh, sorry, I have I have to explain another thing what was missing. In the trade protocol, when you create a two or three multisig, we are creating additionally an extra transaction, a time-locked payout transaction, where all the money from the multisig is uh, spent and sent to the BISC donation address. <coughs> uh, so let's say, uh, yeah, one is selling two Bitcoin and there's some security deposits. So all in all, there's 2.2 Bitcoin in the multisig then both traders are signing a time lock pair transaction where this 2.2 uh, Bitcoin from the multisig is sent directly to the BISC donation address. And the time lock is, um, has to be defined, but roughly one month. <coughs> and uh, the, I, yeah, I don't explain the details, a few details what we have to take care that it's safe, but uh, that's not a problem and it's solved. So, <coughs> Uh, both traders have basically this uh, payout transaction, which they could publish after this one month. Before the one month, it will be rejected by the network. It's just invalid. And after one month, when the trade has not been closed in a normal way, either by completing the trade or by, mediate, by a mediated payout, then both have basically the power to burn the full amount of the money. So the security deposit and the trade amount is gone for both. But then, of course, when you get cheated by the other trader, then uh, yeah, you want you want to get back the money. And there are two options. Then what you can do: one is that you are asking for a reimbursement of your lost money. Let's say it was a two Bitcoin trade with Monero, and with the security deposit, maybe you have lost uh, two point one Bitcoin. So you convert it with the current uh, PSQ rate uh, to PSQ, and you make a reimbursement request to the DAO you are presenting the evidence from the mediator. The mediator said that you should get the money, so you have done everything right. The DAO stakeholders have no, um, no reason why they should doubt it when there is nothing weird that there are suddenly 100 cases from the same mediator. Then, of course, they have to check uh, more closely what this mediator is doing. But uh, when there is no reason for any doubt, the stakeholders will likely accept it. I mean, they, they don't want to punish or they don't want to create damage for the users and lose users. So economically, they have no incentive to not accept this uh, reimbursement request. And technically, it's the same like a compensation request. So yeah, this user basically gets paid by the DAO in BSQ when it gets accepted. And then he can sell the BSQ to Bitcoin again and has basically uh, has 
got the damage refunded. And an important part is that these reimbursement cases have to be considered as exceptional. They shouldn't happen like 10 reimbursement requests every month. It can be maybe one a month or even less. And when it, when it would be too much, we need to figure out why it happens uh, too often. And that's the experience from arbitration over three years. There are basically nearly no scam attempts because users have not the chance to, to succeed beside their stolen bank account scams. We never had scams actually. <clears throat> and uh, and usually, yeah, it's it's some stupid problems, but all this can be resolved in consensus. So we expect that with mediation, we can resolve 99.9%. .9 and when not, and there are some issues open like yeah, it could be that a uh, trader, a new, newbie doesn't know that he has to be online and it's just not available and you cannot reach him. <clears throat> but such problems we can solve by increasing the security deposit, for instance. I mean, this newbie will probably, when he has to lock up a lot of money, then he will take care and read the pop-ups and not forget about this. So I think that probably is all solvable. Uh, it will be a little bit of an experiment to see how it works in real, in real life. But we know already from arbitration cases that Disputes or the real disputes where they're fighting and say, No, I've sent the money and the other, no, I've not received it, and they don't agree or so, it nearly never happened. And so we expect that this reimbursement case will be super rare. And <clears throat> yeah, so the one option is that the user who has lost the money, that he makes the <clears throat> reimbursement request. Of course, the other could do it as well, but I mean, he has not the, not the chance basically when the arbitrator uh, when the mediator said yeah trader a should get the money and trader b has breached the contract trader b will be rejected by the DAO, so why should even try it so it's unlikely that both will do it and if they do it yeah the voters have to think and just think logically and reject one and accept the other and that's uh, closed and then there is a second solution <clears throat> because it's a little bit of a friction for a user first you need to understand the whole concept and then they have to wait and then yeah, they have to convert it uh, from PSQ back to Bitcoin and so on. So it has some hassle and some friction for him. And to avoid this, we we are offering a role. Uh, so <clears throat> there will be basically something like an arbitrator again, uh, how we call it, it's not defined yet, but let's call it still arbitrator. And he will do a second round uh, dispute resolution. So he, when, yeah, when the user decides, okay, he wants to go to arbitration, then the arbitrator will check the case again. So it's like the Supreme Court in a way. Yeah, you get the second chance for a, uh, for a judgment. And when it comes to a solution, then the arbitrator will pay from his pocket, the one who sh should get the money, the funds. If it's 100% or just 90%, that's up to discussion with the fee, but uh, just ignore it at the moment. The fee, maybe we start with 100%. So when, in our example, the one trader has lost 2.1 uh, Bitcoin. The arbitrator will pay him the 2.1 Bitcoin. So basically the trader is, is satisfied. He has got the money. It, the only different to now is that uh, he needed to wait for one month for the uh, delayed payout transaction because before the money is burned, uh, we cannot do this because otherwise you could cheat the system by making a self-trade and basically claim that you got cheated and then get refund it from the arbitrate and then the day later you make the payout to your other uh, civil trader. To avoid this we need to make sure that the trade amount is basically lost. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, the arbitrator, uh, uh, when he pays from his pocket, he wants to get refunded as well of course and he's doing it the same way. He's basically taking over the claim for a reimbursement from the user and doing the, uh, the reimbursement for himself, get paid as get reimbursed by the BISC DAO, needed to provide the evidence about the case that can be all um, automated uh, mostly, that um, all the, yeah, the data are verified and everything. <clears throat> the BISC stakeholders have it even easier because it's a kind of like a bonded role. So um, <clears throat> they trust the arbitrator more like a random trader. So they will accept it probably and the arbitrator after one month, he gets the BSQ, he can sell the BSQ to Bitcoin and has back the Bitcoin. So the arbitrator is taking here two roles. One is this <clears throat> dispute resolution, basically the same like the mediator. Uh, and the second is that he's basically buying the claim for reimbursement from the trader to help the trader that he doesn't uh, have to do this extra work. 
and lose this extra time. <clears throat> and the arbitrator is doing this job basically for the trader then. And midterm, we should get that, that it, it's a clear cost. I mean, uh, the arbitrator is losing time. He takes some risk with volatility and all this. And there's some open risk that it, get, uh, it becomes rejected. He need to have uh, quite a little bit of money when there are many cases. He need to basically pre-fund uh, all this Bitcoin and then get it back uh, two or three months later. <laughs> uh, so all this risk needs to be covered. All these costs need to be paid. And we shouldn't socialize this cost to the whole DAO. But rather, the service should pay this directly. And it's a little bit like these claims for Mt. Gox, the people who have lost the Mt. Gox. <laughs> they waiting since many years for getting back the money and there are some companies who are offering a pay, uh, who are buying this claim so you can sell it. the claim to these companies. They're only offering, I think, 10% of your Bitcoin, so they pay very little. And yeah, when you don't want to deal with this and wait another five years to get back the money, you can sell it and then they are getting uh, your, your claim. And here it's basically the arbitrator is taking this role and midterm, I think there should be some costs, like something like 10% in, included. When the trader don't want to spend this cost, he can do it himself. And as said, we have always to keep in mind that this situation should be considered exceptional. It shouldn't happen at every uh, uh, five, fifth trade or whatever. So when it's more like two cases per month for reimbursement, we basically have to work to bring it down to maximum one case per per cycle. And I think that's realistic because yeah, that's from our experience that it's doable. And um, <clears throat> yeah, that's the goal basically. With this, we are removing completely. There's no third key of the arbitrator at all anymore. There's no le legal risk anymore. The arbitrator is a service provider who are basically uh, pre-funding you your claim and then dealing to get uh, yeah, dealing himself with the DAO to get refunded for this. Uh, for this uh, prepayment to the to the trader. Um, is there is there uh, you said there are two options. The first option is that the trader uh, himself uh, does the the compensation request on his lost yeah I don't know Bitcoin something like this, or and there is an arbitra uh, arbitrator. Yeah. Is this is this is this both uh, uh, available at the yeah. same time, or it's, is it still to decide? And that's a good thing. It's available just in time. You don't need to decide it uh, in advance when you create the offer or whatever. Just at the moment when you are waiting, maybe yeah, you have a case where you don't want to agree because you think the mediator has um, yeah, paid too much to the other peer and you should get more, and you have to wait for one month. That creates already pressure. Maybe then. When you wait two weeks and say, nah, I want to get the money out, even if I lose uh, 1% or 2%, what I expected to get back. Uh, <clears throat> so users get a little bit of pressure to come to a consensus, which is good for the, for the network. We don't want that they are super uh, yeah, head, a strong head and think, uh, yeah, now what? Because they just made a small breach of the contract and the mediator decided to give the security deposit to the other, and then they are not happy with this. Uh, <laughs> and then after this one month, they can basically click the button. Uh, they have two options or uh, start reimbursement. By this button click, they are publishing their delayed payer transaction and they are starting to make a reimbursement request in the DAO. Also, that is basically a manual process because they have to wait for being in the compensation, uh, in, the, in the proposal phase and so on. But they get all the instructions what to do. And the Re, uh, the precondition is that they have published a delayed payout transaction. Without this, they cannot do anything. And the second option, the second button is to yeah, request arbitration or get the refund from arbitration. Uh, and then the arbitrator will check again. And when he thinks that you should get the refund or the, the arbitrator can decide however he would do the payout. It's like now can be. 50 50 can be 100 percent to one or it can be everybody get back uh, security deposit it the only difference is that the money is not coming from the deposit transaction but it comes from the arbitrator's wallet <clears throat> but for the trade it doesn't matter the trader gets the money back and if it comes from the deposit or from the arbitrator wallet has basically no impact for the trader he is happy that he got them back the money in a reasonable time 
Uh, I mean, it depends how long they arbitrate the need for the dispute resolution. That also can take uh, whatever, a few days or a week. And then he makes the payout and the case is closed. And then the arbitrator has to do the steps with the reimbursement. And after one or two months, he gets back the money and he then to sell the BSQ to Bitcoin and so on. But in the donation address, I mean, this money for the DAO, it's a zero sum game. Assuming there's zero volatility, of course, with volatility, there can be up or down. <clears throat> But assuming zero volatility, the yeah the 2.2 Bitcoin in our example trade goes to the donation address. The owner of the donation address have to burn this or buy up BSQ on the market with this. So he's basically a BSQ buyer and giving the Bitcoin basically to one of the contributors and uh, in exchange for BSQ and then burning the BSQ. So basically the the same like a fee payment and then the reimbursement is creating the new bsq in the value of 2.2 bitcoin and yeah for the DAO it's uh, destroyed let's say 22,000 bsq by burning it and then later reimbursing 22,000 bsq so yeah it's a zero change uh, from the economic perspective there's just okay uh, um, time delay and volatility risk but besides this so uh, to sum that up, if we have, if, uh, let me try if, if I can uh, uh, say it correctly. If you, if you start a trade, you are uh, just as, as we do now, you agree on a trade uh, and you can perform it. And if everything goes uh, according to plan, nothing will change for the user. Is this correct? Yes, sir. Okay, so, uh, but what you have to do is, if you, no, no, there's, there is no change. If you, if you, uh, the, 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 the timeout, uh, the delayed uh, payout is, is there basically already because you have to, to own the, the Bitcoin or whatever. You yeah, want that's to sell done to buy the trade protocol. The trade protocol at the take offer process has a few extra handshakes for creating this delayed payout transaction <clears throat> and that's kept in both applications but the user doesn't see anything it's just technical yeah. stuff in okay. the background but uh, yeah but the user okay. experience is basically zero change to the moment the only change happened when he when one of them are rechecking the mediation <clears throat> then it's also, it's not much different from user experience because now they go to arbitration. And here also, I mean, they go, they're not going directly to arbitration. They will get the pop-up or whatever, where they get explained, yeah, you have two options, either do a reimbursement for yourself or request another arbitration and get refunded from the arbitrator. Okay, well, before we, we reach this uh, one month, you said in, a, in the example timeout limit, uh, if, if we decide, well, after, let's say, three days, uh, something has gone wrong, then you go to, to mediation. And the, first of all, you can use the trader chat to yeah. uh, communicate with, with the other trade partner directly and try to resolve it without any third party involved. Is this correct? Yeah. Also, the, the uh, trader chat and mediation is exactly like now. <laughs> And uh, yeah, first you try it yourself, then you try it with the mediator, the mediator make a suggestion about the payout, and then it's up to the traders to accept it. And when they would reject it and the one month is not over, they will get an information. Yeah, they cannot, uh, they have to wait uh, for this one month or maybe it's shorter, we have to decide on this, uh, how long this delay will be. So um, one, one use case would be uh, if, if uh, let's say, I am on vacation, I had a hardware failure, something like this, and I have not been able to meet, uh, let's say, 24 hours uh, uh, timeout. Uh, then I can say, well, I have my system up and running again. Uh, wait, uh, I had this problem, let me just start a payment and everything is fine. It's not in, yeah. in, in the 24 hours uh, uh, timeout, but uh, it's within a week or so. Yeah, I think that's also current, I'm mean, 100% sure, but I think, uh, when you get their payout from the mediator, you still can continue to trade normally. So when you have received the fiat and you click or you accept basically the, uh, yeah, you confirm that you have received the fiat, then the trade has completed like normal without 
even if yeah. the mediator said, yeah, you are guilty, you should lose your security deposit. But maybe in the trader chat, you are agreeing with the other, you explain, yeah, sorry, I was, uh, I, yeah, yeah, was not a, a malicious uh, thing. I had a, a problem like a, a half yeah. disk failure. And the other say, yeah, fine, everything, we are completing the trade without any issue, nobody's losing money. Yeah, but you had, we don't. Uh, uh, there is no no need for for the uh, for the mediator to get involved unless one of the traders initiates the, exactly, the mediation yeah. process. Okay. So mediation only starts when anybody is starting the mediation. Then it's in mediation, <clears throat> and even if yeah, when there is the result out, they still have the option to continue the, the trade like yeah. normal yeah. Uh, yeah. when they want, and. Only when one is rejecting and say, no, that's not fair. I, and then they, yeah, first they have to wait until the timeout is over. <clears throat> Maybe we make the timeout depending on the payment methods because with SEPA, it's already eight days to trade, or six days, <clears throat> the trade period. <clears throat> so we need a longer timeout and so, and yeah. for Alcoin, it's just one day. So maybe we have different time. Uh, uh, but I mean, it's, I think it's a feature to have a little bit of longer time because it causes pressure. When it's very short, then people get quickly to the arbitration case and the arbitrator has, uh, we, we want to avoid that this happens often because it's, uh, yeah, it's a friction and we don't want to have the reimbursements basically. It should okay, be really so, exceptional. The goal so is let's, that the users agree on consensus for a payout, either by normally or with a trader chat or whatever, or with mediation. And that should okay, be Okay, what, what happens if, if one of the traders uh, is not reachable anymore? Yeah, that's so one of the, the main cases actually what what leads to <clears throat> to real uh, problems uh, that yeah, one is just not reacting. I think it ha we have increased security deposit over the last uh, year or so and that has reduced those cases as far as I heard from arbitrators. And I think it still happens with very small amounts. So when people are only losing 20 euros, they don't care. But a cure will be to increase the security deposit for uh, small trades. So when so people are losing 50 euros, they will care. This is an attack that is performed regularly, but not uh, that much. Uh, not, not an attack. Uh, it's just uh, newbies mainly. They don't read how. They don't understand how BISC works. They don't read the pop-ups, and yeah. And when they talk, when they don't have much skin in the game, they don't care. It's. Uh, I think it's just about this that when when you do something where hundred euro is on stake, you're reading the stuff because that's quite yeah, a little of bit course. of money. When it's just five euro, you're lazy and just click some buttons and yeah, and don't care. And then the damage is on the other user side, and or on BISC side when we have reimbursements for tiny amounts, it's it's a friction with what we don't want to. So to fix this, um, yeah, we can play around with this parameter of the security deposits or. Okay, um, so if if uh, if a case goes goes into mediation and uh, uh, one of the trading peers does not respond. Uh, then the mediator is uh, is I, I believe uh, I understand that the mediator gets all the information uh, he needs. So the same information as the arbitrator gets in the current trade protocol. Yeah, uh, and the then he has some evidence and comes to a conclusion. So it's it's a court decision, uh, and yeah. but then he cannot enforce the decision, <coughs> but he can only uh, suggest the decision. Yeah, exactly. Right. That's the difference. Yes. Now the arbitrator can make the payout directly, even if one is not available. Now we have a two of two multi six, so one trader cannot do the payout alone. When one trader is not available, uh, it goes to reimbursement at the end. But with this so new if, model, if, if one trader is not available, the you you run out of the month of of time left uh, of the timeout, and then you can yeah. decide whether you want to uh, reimburse, uh, uh, make a compensation request yourself, or uh, consult the future arbitrator. Yeah, exactly. And then you get yeah, the arbitrator is basically doing the service for you to give you the money immediately, and the arbitrator is taking the the work for doing the extra yeah, waiting and the reimbursement and all this. Okay, so the arbitrator is is for a small fee. He pays you. He, he, that yeah. I mean, <clears throat> we have to figure out this: uh, how much the arbitrator will cost. <laughs> The arbitrator is basically a contributor. He will, per case, and I mean, there will be a base uh, cost because he need to be online and be available. And then per case, like the mediators, they get paid per case something. And then we need to figure out over time if this is enough for the arbitrator that they are doing their job in a, in a high quality and trustworthy. 
will be probably a bonded role at some point. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but uh, uh, I, I believe if you uh, you said if you if you say well you have these two options. First option is you do it yourself. Second option is you use the arbitrator service. Um, yeah. You have to. You said you you let's say the arbitrator for the trading peers the arbitrator uh, costs a, a little bit. So that because if if it's the same amount, I just go straight to the arbitrator and say well. Uh, Use the arbitration service because then I don't have to bother myself. And yeah. So, then... so uh, I mean, I think the initial goal is that we don't shock users with a difficult change where people need time to understand it, and people are very used to the arbitration system and they love this, and they don't want the change. That's my experience from feedback, and we need to make it as easy as possible to the new system that for them. It's the only different will be this delay, basically, because yeah, they, now they need to wait a little bit, but also with arbitration. I mean, there is no, when the arbitrator needs one month to resolve the issue, he needs one month, there's no guarantee. Uh, so usually it resolves quickly in a few days, but it can be when there's a complicated case, it can take weeks. And uh, so now it's basically the mandatory waiting time. Uh, and after this, you get when you choose to use the arbitrator, you get the payout directly from the arbitrator. So for the user experience, it's not much a change. And uh, doing the reimbursement himself is then a change because you need to understand the DAO and you yeah, need to get the information and have confidence in PSQ and all this. And to avoid this friction, yeah, that's why we had the second option. But long term or mid term, we want to apply realistic costs. I think in the beginning, it's probably okay, basically, when we are socializing this cost to the DAO, because we don't want to lose users that they are too afraid and don't use BISC anymore because they don't trust this new concept. And, and when we see out after one or two months that there are nearly no cases at all for such arbitration, and then there are just, when there are just two users who are using it for a month, they are basically causing us the cost for the for this arbitrator. Maybe the arbitrator cost us also 5,000 BSQ per month. Then two traders for maybe tiny trades cost us 5,000 BSQ. That's not economically rational. So at some point we will apply the fees or the cost to the users. And when the users, yeah, how we do it, that's up to discussion, but it should be, uh, uh, yeah, it should be the direct cost that the user who is consuming the service has to pay for it. And when there is no economy around, when there's only one user a month and he's basically only paying 10% and with a small trade that's nearly no money, then there will be no such an arbitrator. And it's not mandatory. When there's no arbitrator, this service doesn't exist. And yeah. and it can be a market because this arbitrator is basically, there's no risk, he cannot steal money. He's in, in the opposite. He's basically paying the money by himself first and then trusting the DAO that he get refunded. So yeah, we we don't have a problem to use anonymous arbitrators in future for this. And okay, so this uh, this is what I wanted to ask the the uh, uh, next. Uh, you, you, you we said uh, you said earlier we want to get rid of the arbitration because there are issues. Uh, then uh, now in the new trade protocol there is an arbitrator again, but uh, it's a slightly diff it's 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 a different role. It's it's called arbitrator. Yeah. but uh, I mean. It, it arbitrators, um, we are still looking for maybe a better name. The good thing is when we still call it arbitrator, then it's more easy for the user to adjust to the new system. And for the user, from the user perspective, there's not much difference. But <laughs> conceptually, it's something different. Uh, it's a mediator plus a kind of like a, a, a claim dealer or claim broker. He's buying, I think a technical term would be underwriter, but I think that's not well known for... <clears throat> They're doing something similar in real life for public companies. So <clears throat> he's basically buying uh, your claim and giving you the money for your for taking over your claim for reimbursement. As you as a trader cannot do the reimbursement again when the arbitrator is doing the reimbursement for your trade. You need to provide the evidence about the trade and then it will be clear that there are two reimbursements, one from the arbitrator, one from the trader, and the trader just get rejected of course then. So would that be an option? Uh, is is this is it planned that uh, the arbitrate the new arbitrators are uh, 
some uh, let's say bonded roles or is it yeah, possible to then. just have a, 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 a pool that you can volunteer as an arbitrator because if yeah, you have the I money, mean, you can buy the debt and you can reimburse it and maybe get some percentage of, of the whole thing out for yourself yeah. But I think it's still important to have it as a bonded role in future because it's somehow a trusted role when he's not, I mean, he's also doing the mediation. So we need to be sure that he's doing the job well and not carelessly. And, and also it's a privacy issue. He collects basically data from trades from users. So we don't want that um, this person is selling this data or whatever. So and that's all reasons to have a bond for this role. I mean, will take a little bit because adding anything to the DAO is uh, difficult and basically you should consider there's no change possible in the DAO, but of course some changes are possible, but it requires a lot of testing and thought. And, uh, but when we come to the point that we want to scale it bigger, then uh, we need to implement the bonded role. In the beginning, probably the existing arbitrators will play this role. They know all their, it's, I mean, a, a problem with scaling up arbitration is the onboarding. It's not a very easy task. You need a lot of information. And at the moment, we don't have the resources to basically do this onboarding, especially to anonymous people where you cannot do a normal chat and explain it. And it has to be all very well documented. And yeah, it's a lot of work to, to get there. And we have other priorities now. But basically, there is no conceptual reason to not be able to scale it up. That's the important thing. It's just from our priorities. I think it's not plan to do this in the next three months, but maybe half a year or whatever. Okay, so uh, the new trade protocol, what, what, uh, with the new trade protocol, we get rid of the, of the main attack point, namely the arbitrator. Yeah. yeah, so all the risks with the arbitrator are vanished. The risk for security, that somebody is stealing the key, and the legal risk that somebody is uh, yeah attacking him and interprets him as a financial intermediary who needs a license or whatever and the other is that the arbitrator makes a wrong payout this risk is still a little bit there <coughs> so when when the arbitrator makes the refund and pays the wrong person then the victim will still complain and he need to make a second payout i think this risk will remain but i think i the the fewer cases there are, I mean, when the arbitrator has five disputes a day, it's a higher risk that he makes once a mistake in a year. Like when their arbitrator has maybe five cases a month or something, or two cases a month or one case a month, where, I mean, that's where we want to go basically. Uh, and then, yeah, it's a, it scales down the risk, but it, theoretically it remains, but uh, it becomes a, a yeah, irrelevant risk. Okay, so the, the, the strategy now is uh, we, we get the new trade protocol up and running. Is there, yeah, uh, you, so said, you said earlier, there is a, it's required, it's, there's a hard fork required. Is it, is it like, yeah. uh, I, I understand <coughs> it this way, um, you have the old trade protocol still available, but no. in order to, to use the new one, you have to, uh, uh, use the, uh, the, the a new software version uh, to trade. Yeah, I explain it. And we have protocol. in the version class, we have a version for the trade protocol, and that's version one currently. And we changed this to version two. And then when you have updated, you have basically version two, and you cannot trade with a user who has version one. So you cannot take off first, they cannot take your off first. The only problem is when you have an open trade or a dispute. <coughs> then there would be issues because we are not supporting both trade protocols in parallel. That would be engineering wise, much more complicated. Uh, so we have to tell the user and communicate to the user that they only ha can update when they have, uh, they have to, uh, to complete their existing trades and maybe de and better deactivate their existing offers. So they're not getting new trades and or disputes. So everything has to be closed <coughs> when all the trades are closed then they can update and then start again. The offers get converted to the new format or to the changes automatically, and you can start again trading. Okay, so the, so the offers, uh, you, you already paid your, your publishing fee for the offers, you don't have to do it again. Yeah, yeah. The, the offers get converted. From City, okay. And yeah, and the second, also we are packing this release 
so this new trade protocol is to 80% implemented. Uh, I think two days may be missing and then maybe small things, uh, yeah, fine tuning UI and so, but all the core is nearly in place. And the other big project in work is the protection tool, <coughs> which enables us to uh, to remove or uh, yeah, to get rid of this uh, annoying small trade limit with 0 0.01 Bitcoin. That's also in the finishing state, and we want to pack both together, <coughs> which also make it easy with uh, update uh, with backward compatibility because the new trade protocol enforces this kind of like semi. It's not the hard fork, it's not the soft fork, it's something in between. <coughs> and the, yeah, the protection tool would also have some backward compatibility issues. And by packing both together, we are, yeah, we are solving. Uh, it's it's much easier to do this update. And yeah. Um, so as it is uh, as it is now is when you when you have your your BISC application running and there is a software update available, there is a pop up. I think that there is a new version or on startup something like this. There is a pop up where it says, "Well, a new version of BISC is about to be there or is available. Uh, do you want to download now? Ignore it or remind me later?" And there would uh, be some some uh, uh, instructions that if you want to yeah. upgrade, you first have to do. This, yeah, this exactly. This. We have yeah. to make this very clear to users uh, in this pop-up um, with bold letters that uh, only up you can only update after you have closed all, completed all your open trades and disputes, and you should uh, deactivate your offers in the meantime so you don't get new trades because otherwise, yeah, you stay with the old version too long, and at a certain point you cannot trade anymore because most people will have updated and you on the old version and there are no offers anymore so people yeah what Should happens be. if you if you miss uh closing uh fulfilling your trades yeah, or then closing will fail arbitration? uh because yeah the the two two multisig doesn't exist anymore so there will be a failure at when you close the trade or when the dispute gets closed or whatever and then you need basically the arbitrator to make a manual payout as a tool where the, the arbitrator, arbitrator. Mm, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's. I mean, the users could do this themselves as well, but the arbitrator knows how to do it. It's a little bit complicated. It's documented in the docs uh, web page. So you basically need to provide the private key for this certain trade. It's only for this, uh, for the for the payout. <clears throat> so there's no security risk with any other money, and you can do it with the other trade also. But then they have to know how to do it, and the technical challenge a little bit, but it's in the UI. <clears throat> so you have a form where you have to put in all the data, like the private key and yeah, all the instructions, uh, or all the data which are laid out uh, in the instructions, what you need. <clears throat> and then both traders or the arbitrator is doing a manual payout with this. So if the money is not at risk, it's just inconvenient and it's a extra hassle for everybody involved. But so people should not do it, but when it happens, it's not a disaster. It's uh, yeah, no money. Is, uh, no, no risk. There's no risk that money is lost or whatever. It's just extra hassle. Okay. Thank you for the presentation on the new trade protocol. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? No questions. Okay. I've got a question. Uh, when yeah. will when will this be implemented? Approximately. Uh, it's, it's nearly implemented, also it's missing, I said, maybe a few days. And I think also plan, uh, the release plan is more or less two or three weeks. So in two or three weeks, I hope we are ready for releasing this 1.2 version, which will be a big milestone. And yeah. Yeah, but, okay, so this is the first one with mediators. And that's with... already deployed. The mediator and the trader chat, it's deployed. The mediator will be activated in two days. It was just mm -hmm. for yeah, for the update process because when only one user has the mediator, it wouldn't work. So we needed to wait a little bit, but that's activated in two days. And then uh, you have this second round, basically, that first it goes to the mediation and then it goes as the second when one is not agreeing to the result of the mediate, but then only then the arbitration starts which helps us already to reduce the cases for real arbitration, probably 
by 90, also decreased these cases by 90 or more percent. But we still have the problem that the two or three more decisions to arbitrate that still have the key and everything. So it doesn't really solve the big problem, but it improves already the, the situation like it was before. Okay, so there is there is a, a few features, namely the, the mediation step is already deployed, let's say, and it will go active in, in two days time. Yeah. So if, if then you click the uh, arbitration button, if something goes wrong and you click the arbitration button, you're not uh, uh, directly going to arbitration, but first to mediation. Is this correct? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And only after mediation, when you recheck, then it goes to arbitration. Okay. Thank you. There is another question. Uh, hi. Yes. Uh, my name's Ian, and uh, I've been doing some uh, market making on BISC this month. And uh, so I was very interested in this new, uh, I guess, the version two. And uh, trying to understand how talked about people... this. Uh... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um... <coughs> uh, do you have, yeah. Do you have a concrete question? Otherwise, I would start to explain version two because I uh, completely forgot about this. That's a very important uh, topic. To, yeah, oh, okay. Too much time. Uh, but... Yeah, my, my question was just related to the BISC uh, bonding BSQs. Yeah. Every, basically, every person. Yeah, maybe I give an overview about version two because uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, but wait, 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 wait a second, please. Um, version two is is this still uh, the new trade, trade protocol trade. or is this no, off chain? Okay, off chain trade protocol. Uh, uh, let's stick for for a second with the with the new trade protocol. Okay. Uh, are there are there any any questions regarding the new trade protocol from the audience? Okay, if there are no more questions, uh, then yeah, well, let's proceed to the yeah. BISC version two and uh, uh, why we need this BISC version two and why there is, uh, why we, why would be a off-chain thing, uh, a, a nice thing to have and what a trade protocol uh, without having BISC, uh, Bitcoin in the BISC application itself would be a great idea. Yeah. Uh, one second, I just opened their issue because I have to with you about all the, the benefits. Yeah, uh, I tried to make it short because we're already one hour. <coughs> also, the, the basic idea of the version, or let's call it off-chain trade protocol, is that we are separating the, the exchange, or the, the trade itself, from the security model. At the moment, with the multisig, it's both tied together. That's why we have the on-chain transaction because we are using the Bitcoin multisig feature as the main security feature. So both have locked up something, and they have to cooperate to get out the money again. Uh, so uh, just to just to, to clarify this, you have uh, now we have um, the, the 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 trade itself is documented on the Bitcoin blockchain. Yeah, and. Uh, there are tons of problems connected to this, but uh, when it was developed, there was no bad idea out. And without a doubt, there uh, would still not be a bad idea out. <clears throat> and while developing the DAO, I came up with the idea we could use this BS coupons to basically provide the security on that side, and then you are completely free on the trade protocol side. So the, the basic idea is <clears throat> that both traders need to set up a BS coupon, which is higher as the maximum trade amount. So let's say you want to trade $1,000 to 1,000 euro. And as I said, as I want to make it clear here, you don't need any cryptocurrency on either side. You can trade Apple to bananas, euro to dollar, Monero to euro, Monero to dollar, Monero to whatever. It's completely, uh, yeah, it's completely independent. <laughs> you. <clears throat> Yeah, let's make this simple case, $1,000 to 1,000 euro. And both traders need to set up a BS coupon, which is higher or at least covering this maximum trade amount. Let's say at the current uh, BSQ price, it's more or less 1,000 BSQ. And this bond, I mean, for those who are not familiar with BS coupon, a bond is basically you are making a transaction, which is marked as a bond lockup transaction then your BSQ cannot be spent anymore. <clears throat> no, you cannot sell this BSQ anymore or whatever. The only uh, possible transaction uh, which can be used to, to use with a bonded uh, BSQ is an unlocked transaction. 
in the unlock transaction is uh, yeah there is a time lock defined but it's not related to the bitcoin time lock it's a bsq or a dao specific time lock <clears throat> and it defines how long it takes until you can really spend the money again let's say the time of this three months then yeah, let's say you are locking up today 1000 BSQ. One month later, you want to unlock it. Then you make the unlock transaction, and then you need to wait, uh, depending on the time block, what has been set. But let's say it was three months, then you need to wait another three months, and only after this other three months, you can use this BSQ like any other BSQ and sell it on the market or so. In this time, you cannot do anything. So it's basically locked in your wallet. And it can be confiscated by the DAO when there is any reason, like the bonded rolls, when the mediator is uh, not doing his job correctly. <clears throat> Somebody can make a confiscation request in the DAO, and the bond from the mediator can be confiscated when there is a huge super maturity, something like 80% or more. And also, it's very hard to confiscate, but the DAO has the possibility to confiscate this money. And then, <clears throat> when the confiscation has to happen before, the lock time is over because after the lock time is over, you can move your money and then we don't know if you are still the owner or if somebody else is the owner and we cannot confiscate this anymore. But basically, like in this example, in the lock, when you lock up, then this first month, it can be confiscated and during the unlock time in this other three months, it can be also confiscated. And that's the reason why the lock time need to be longer, like the DAO cycle and the time what the community would need to investigate. So it will be minimum two months or so, better three months to have enough time. And with that, basically, you're proving, okay, I'm willing to make this bail or to <clears throat> uh, this deposit, and I'm an honest user. When I, when it's proven that I'm a scammer, that I have be, uh, betrayed the other trader, then the DAO stakeholders have the right to burn my bond. So that's the core of the protection mechanism. <clears throat> and with that, uh, when yeah, when both are uh, and that's like in real life, trades are happening and, and normal stuff is happening. When you're working for a company or whatever, you don't, I mean, <clears throat> you're, you're bonding basically with your freedom. When you are stealing stuff in a company, then they go to court and you may end up in jail. So basically your life or your freedom is, is, is your bond, what you bring in in every relationship. And here we are using BSQ bonds. And with that, uh, the trade itself, you can, you just need to agree on some contract. <clears throat> where usually some third party, a mediator, as a dispute resolu resolution is included, but theoretically you could also agree to not have any, but then nobody can help you. Uh, and we can use the current mediation system basically for this, but it could be also a, a lawyer or any, doesn't matter. You just agree with the other trader when there's a problem, we have this trusted third party who will investigate the case, he make a decision and we both will uh, accept his decision. We trust this, that this is a fair judge, and whatever he decides is basically accepted. So that's the terms of the contract. And we are doing the trade with whatever uh, payment method, can be lightning, can be bank transfer, can be face-to-face, -face, can be anything. And these terms are all defined in the contract. We are signing this contract both, and then we are starting the trade. And by starting the trade, we need, let's, Let's make an example that we have bonded 5,000 BSQ and we make a trade with 1,000 uh, US dollar. Uh, we don't want to make a bond for every single trade because then we don't gain anything. I mean, we, what we gain here is that we don't need to make a Bitcoin transaction for every trade anymore, which uh, reduces the cost for mining fees. And in future, mining fees will become very expensive at some point. Uh, we are <clears throat> avoiding all the privacy issues with on-chain on -chain transactions. Now all the transactions and the trades are connected when you're not taking a lot of care and extra, uh, yeah, you, you're paying costs on, on convenience. <clears throat> and and the time you need to, to wait for a blockchain confirmation with the current trade protocol, uh, otherwise it wouldn't be secure. In this model, you don't need this. Uh, when both have confirmed that they have received the money, it's gone and uh, it's done, and it can be basically instant when you do a Bitcoin to Litecoin uh, Lightning trade. The trade has been executed in two seconds when both are online, and you don't need to be online <laughs> when you make an offer because there. I mean that the offer, uh, the maker need to be online. The re 
uh, conceptual requirement comes from the point that you need to make the signature for the deposit transaction. So when you shut down your computer, you cannot sign this deposit transaction. But that's not needed here anymore. So the offerer don't need to be online anymore. So basically, we are getting much more closely to the experience of a centralized exchange. It's still different because it's still peer to peer and so, but a lot of the conceptual problems, what we cannot solve with the current protocol, will be done. And it's a big game changer. We don't need a wallet, a Bitcoin wallet anymore, because then you don't need to trade Bitcoin. It can be anything. And we should remove then the security risk to have an integrated wallet. The only wallet which will be required is the BSQ wallet, which is technically also a Bitcoin wallet, but people will not have um, whatever $100,000 uh, in BSQ on the wallet, but can be that they have $100,000 uh, in Bitcoin when they have 10 Bitcoin on the wallet. It's a lot of money and a lot of risk. <coughs> so yeah, it's, it's a big change in nearly all aspects. And the challenge and the core of this protocol will be how to track, because you should be able to reuse this bond for parallel trades. When you have locked up 5,000 BSQ, you should be able to make five trades with $1,000 in parallel. When you have closed one trade, then uh, yeah, <clears throat> then you have basically 1,000 BSQ free again. It's just that the sum of the parallel trades must not be higher like the bonded amount and uh, avoiding all volatility questions and so on. Uh, also uh, ignoring all this, this problem. So the bond will be in reality a little bit higher to cover some volatility risk and so on. But um, just to keep it simple at the moment, let's ignore all this. So when you start your first trade, you have to publish some data on the peer-to-peer -peer network, which is cryptographically signed. And as it's quite a complex uh, protocol, what we have in mind, but it's not, we, we're trying to find a better and more simple protocol. Um, <clears throat> but the basics is when you start the trade, you are signaling to the network that your bond has gone down from 5,000 to 4,000 BSQ. There's only 4,000 BSQ available for other trades. When you sec start the second trade, and the trade would be 6,000 uh, uh, euro, the other trader will see <clears throat> that uh, you cannot take you cannot make this trade because you have only 4,000 BSQ bond and that's not enough for doing a $6,000 trade. And that, yeah, and when you close the trade, when you complete it, then your bond goes up again. You are publishing another data structure on the peer to peer network, which proves that, yeah, everything is completed and you can use again your full bond for the next trade. And this tracking of the bond. That's the complexity and that's the challenge where we need to find a really solid solution as we have some solution which seems to work, but we are not really happy with it yet. And we, we need more time to get this really solid and very clear and, and yeah, that's the core of the whole protocol and there shouldn't be any doubt that there might be some risk or some, some, yeah, some issues with this. <laughs> And it's a little bit like lightning channels. When you open a lightning channel, you make once a Bitcoin transaction where you are yeah, putting in the money and then you can make millions of, of uh, payments in lightning. And only when you close it, there's another Bitcoin transaction and you cannot exceed the channel when you only have a very tiny channel, you cannot make big payments. And here it's the same. When you set up the bond, you can trade up to the amount of this bond. You could have multiple bonds and then, yeah, uh, use those multiple bonds for different trades or whatever, but uh, you cannot exceed it. And when you're closing the bond, uh, as soon the bond has been really unlocked, basically after this time, <coughs> um, oh, sorry, <coughs> yeah. When you're closing the trade, basically the bond is gone <coughs> and you cannot use it anymore. So yeah, that's the rough uh, overview. Probably I forgot some important stuff, but <clears throat> I think what uh, the main thing what we have to consider that it's it's really a it's really a new version of BISC. So probably we have to deploy it, and also it's a really a different application because it will be such a radical change to the current model that yeah doesn't make sense to try to make it backward compatible or whatever. And probably both versions will coexist then because it's yeah you need to have this uh, BSQ bond. So some people don't want to buy BSQ for whatever reason, or they don't want to set up this high bond because it's more than 100% security deposit. 
but you can start with small bonds when you only want to buy 100 euro in Bitcoin or so you make a small bond with 100 PSQ and then when you have more money you make a bigger bond or whatever but it might not fit for everybody so and it will take probably some time until people get used to it so for all these reasons we will probably keep both versions running for a while and I think that it carries so much advantages like I said yeah you can trade anything against anything you can make instant trades you have a lot of improvements from privacy from costs, there's no minor fee included anymore. Uh, you don't need to be online as an offer maker. So it comes with tons of improvements and I think most of the users will move over over time to this. And, and then the old version probably will die off because they're probably not more, much interest anymore, but it's up to the market. So we will, that's a rough plan to basically support both in parallel until we see that the old protocol is not used anymore and then at some point it will die off. Yeah, that's uh, the basic overview. I mean, I don't want to explain how the protocol works. It's described in this document. <clears throat> but I said we want to continue to find maybe a more simple, more clear version. We are not very happy. It seems that it technically and security-wise and privacy-wise, it seems that it works, but we're not very sure and it would require much more time and analysis. And hopefully we come up with a more simple version. It's a little bit involved and a little bit complex. Are there any questions? I think, we, yeah, <clears throat> what I want to mention is that we have to really keep this in mind. I mean, that's the future of BISC. The current model with on-chain transaction is not future-proof. When, when a Bitcoin mining fee will be, again, up to $50 or even $100, uh, it will be too expensive. We are just uh, paying for, for the Bitcoin miners. Uh, and we always have these restrictions with it's slow, it's, you have to be online. I mean, we, we never can really compete with, uh, yeah, with centralized exchanges on many areas. And we have always the security risk uh, that we have the Bitcoin wallet. And yeah, it makes everything much more difficult. And I think we really should focus to make this uh, big step forward to get rid of all these problems by a algorithmic change, basically that the protocol is just based on completely different uh, concepts. And with that, it might have different risks and so on. The DAO and the PSQ will become much more important and, yeah, and with that maybe vulnerable. Volatility will become an issue and so on. So it has its own problems in a way, but uh, I think it's superior to what we have at the moment. Okay, thank you for the initial presentation. Um, Let's just to sum it up. If if um, let's say I want to, uh, did I understand that correctly? If if we have this new BISC, this BISC version two, uh, then it's basically uh, a marketplace like let's say Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, something like this, where you can find uh, a trade partner. I you either can buy a car, you can know, buy BISC, you can buy I, Bitcoin, you can, I mean, you can buy... I mean, theoretically, yes, but having a real marketplace requires reputation. In a, in a currency exchange, there is a binary result. Either you got the money or not. You don't care if the money was green or blue or uh, whatever. I mean, it doesn't have a color. When you receive the dollar, you're yes, happy. <laughs> when you are buying an iPhone on eBay, it might be that you received the iPhone, but it was different like on the photo and you want to leave a feedback because he was not happy with the trade and yeah, yes, not the yes, binary course, outcome. Yes, and so all it requires a different interface. It, yeah, it requires some sort of reputation and we don't have a solution for a decent reputation system yet. It can be done. Yeah, so basically you can, uh, the, if you say, well, uh, <coughs> you, you want to, to, to limit it to uh, currencies. I think that should be the first goal <clears throat> because otherwise we are trying to solve too many problems at once. It could be evolved later to a, Whatever, I mean, in the core, it's a it's a it's a decentralized justice system where the bond is basically the way how you secure anything, any any economic interaction, and that can be can be a, a, a freelancer marketplace where a work yeah where work uh, is that what you exchange? It can be anything yeah, but I think that's uh, that's a far future, and uh, I would not target too too much of this because it's hard enough to get it done for the currency exchange. That's our 
core competence <clears throat> and then yeah then we will see if people want to extend it to something more and so but that might be then also different applications or whatever okay well basically you have this uh let's stick with the with the term marketplace you, you go to the marketplace and then there is you cannot buy iphones or cars but you can buy uh currency with other yeah, currency a currency marketplace i would define it at the beginning at least to restrict yeah. it to this because um, you know, we don't need replication uh, and then uh, you find your trade partner uh, and you, you can uh, you can do, do nothing because you first have to uh, set up a bond so uh, yeah. it's it's a security let's say you you already pay for stuff you are going to exchange beforehand so yeah. that others uh, have uh, can trust you that you actually do uh, fulfill the the, the trade yeah. if it's similar like when we would have 100 percent security deposit now then it would be very similar i mean you don't when you only want to do one trade and not in parallel then when you want to buy a, a, one bitcoin it costs you ten thousand dollar so you need a ten thousand uh, dollar bond and it would be the same like in a current model when we would have 100 percent security deposit then as a buyer you need to have already one bitcoin what you put in a security deposit and you get it back afterwards with the bond of course it's more long term and so on and you can reuse it but uh similar yeah but basically if you want to buy this car uh then you have to first set up the the, uh, the security deposit and then you have to buy the car so you you in yeah. order to get the car you have to spend initially you have to spend twice the amount uh the car costs but then uh, if the trade is completed yeah. uh, you can uh unlock the bond again and then you have this this uh, yeah. trade completed um, and that's for sure some restriction but i think it's i mean in real life you don't need to do it because you are bonding with your freedom when you yeah i mean otherwise our economy would not work when you need to have everywhere a hundred security bond of the maximum damage when you have a cleaning lady and you ask for ten thousand dollar of bond to clean your house because maybe that's the maximum damage what you could make you will not find a cleaning lady or you have to pay her 500 euro an hour so in real life we are using our freedom when she's stealing stuff you go to the police and she end up in jail in the worst case so but we don't have this in a decentralized system in where people can trade anonymously so we use money for giving the security and to get over this people can borrow the money <laughs> There could be a, a, a lending market. That's a very old idea where yeah, you don't have the security. You, uh, also in the current model, when you don't have the initial Bitcoin, you can find somebody who trusts you for whatever reason, because you're a cool user on Twitter or Facebook or wherever, or maybe you know him personally, and he's borrowing you the money, and then you can trade, and then you're paying him back with interest rate the money later. And with that, we can solve this problem as well. So when you are trustworthy, you go basically to the Bitcoin bank or to a normal bank and, and ask for a loan for hundred uh, for $10,000 for buying a car. And then you can trade and get the car and then you're paying the bank back the loan and the bank will do with you the risk analysis and the rating. If you're trustworthy or not, then they are taking the risk that you're not paying back and you're paying a fee for this. Okay, so uh, but uh, in in the in the BISC application, the BISC version two application, this marketplace basically, there is no Bitcoin wallet in, uh, included. So if you if you agree on a trade, in the yeah, in the best the case, BISC let's cube. say in the ideal case, uh, then if you agree on a trade, uh, then you have to use third party software to actually do. Uh, let's say the, the Bitcoin transaction. Yeah. Uh, same as we now have to do uh, the go to your bank, do it a fiat transaction and yeah. then click the, the button. Yeah. But I mean, the, the button click is, uh, you, you, you're still on the BISC, on this BISC version two, you still yeah, have this button where you click and say, well, I have started the payment, uh, but there is no integration of, of uh, what uh, wallet whatsoever. Exactly. I mean, <clears throat> that's an open, maybe people are building their own kind of like interfaces where they're connecting their Monero wallet and taking the risk when somebody hacks it, that the Monero wallet gets empty. But uh, <clears throat> I think we should avoid to implement this and deliver this because we are carrying them. Yeah, we are, we are ex again exposed to this vulnerability. And 
there is still this wallet for PSQ and also you need Bitcoin for trading PSQ. I mean, one thing you can swap, you can convert Bitcoin to PSQ in an atomic transaction. <clears throat> So you don't need to trade BSQ like an altcoin now. That could be already done now uh, because BSQ is technically Bitcoin. So when you want to exchange BSQ, you can make it in one transaction where one input is BSQ, one input is Bitcoin from the other trader and the outputs are swapped. And there's no security risk and no trust uh, issues because it's one single atomic transaction. Either it works or it doesn't work. So it's really a conversion, basically. You click a button, convert. Yeah, there's a market of offers, BSQ to Bitcoin, and you take the best offers. Uh, you see what will be the conversion rate. You're clicking a button and you're converting your Bitcoin to BSQ. And with the next blockchain confirmation, you have it. Uh, and this functionality will be in. And so technically, there will be a Bitcoin wallet because it's, uh, BSQ is Bitcoin technically. But it should be really limited for BSQ. And it shouldn't be used as a kind of like a savings or a trading wallet. People should use a hardware wallet or their Bitcoin core for, for lightning or whatever. And that we are, ex we are externalizing all this risk to professional wallets who are only doing wallets and nothing else. We shouldn't become a wallet provider like we're doing now in a way. That was not a good idea at the end, but it was a requirement because we had a trade protocol requires a wallet. Hello? I think I lost, yes, yes. Uh, I, my headset is dying soon. One, one second, I'm changing it to. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. yeah um, that's basically. That is, that is, is, that is quite a big change. Hmm. Sorry? Uh, it this uh, sounds like quite a big change. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a new, it's really a new application. It's uh, and it it helps us, and that's why I'm so fascinated by it. <clears throat> there were so many hard problems where there were basically no solutions, like how you could speed up a BISC trade to make it really fast, or how you can avoid that uh, offer maker don't need to be online, or how can we avoid that we at the, currently we have four transactions for a, a trade, which is very expensive in a way and also for privacy reason, how it's all very difficult problems where there are nearly no solutions or very difficult solutions, partially solutions. <clears throat> and with this model, yeah, all are gone immediately. There, there are no we privacy on the blockchain anymore because you only have this one bond and the one bond can carry it out like lightning. Uh, you can have hundreds of thousands of trades and they're not really connected. I mean, this the, the protocol, how to track the bond that is a yeah th that's a challenge how to do this to protect privacy but um, i think it works good enough already what we have the idea is good enough to be completely superior to that what we have now are there already solutions uh sorry uh, are there already solutions out there for let's say yeah well let's uh, let's reuse this word arbitration what i think it will be there a pure mediation <clears throat> The mediator make, is a judge, he make a statement and the execution will be by the DAO. And maybe we can provide this as well, that basically this current arbitrator, what we're implementing now <clears throat> is a kind like a, it could be basically a marketplace for people who are buying your claim and giving you the money directly for a fee. That's what the arbitrator is doing. Yeah. So there are two roles here. One is just a judge who is doing the decision. <clears throat> but he cannot execute it. The execution is always better than our stakeholders. And then there could be another service provider when the users don't want to deal with the reimbursement. Yeah, you are selling your claim and somebody is doing this work for you and make a little bit of money with this. How long will it take to actually get there? What is the, the, time, <coughs> the time frame? I, I wanted to start to work a few weeks on it because as I was underestimating a little bit, or I was expecting or hoping <clears throat> that the core protocol was solid enough to just go for it. But after in analyzing it further, I had the feeling yeah, it needs more time. And <clears throat> because it's then a really a, a strong hard fork as a new application, we should combine it with other improvements like yeah, DDoS protection for peer-to-peer -peer network and many other things and we should use this opportunity to make really a big improvements in many areas so we shouldn't rush it to just make it 
I think the core protocol, when we would do the idea what we have, it's not super complicated. It's a little bit more like the current protection tool. I assume it could be done, or I could do it probably, this core protocol I could do probably in one month. And then the rest is UI work. And it's much easier like now because the trade protocol is just clicking a few buttons and showing some stuff and the mediation we have. It's not, I mean, all the complex stuff with creating transactions and, and, and ensuring this security will be all gone and delegated to, the, yeah, to this uh, bond tracking protocol. And this bond tracking protocol is just conceptually complex, but implementation-wise, yeah, it uses some hashes, it uses peer-to-peer -peer network, uses signatures, nothing, there's no rocket science behind this. It's just how it all plays together and that it's secure and protects privacy and the incentives are correct and so on. That's a tricky part and to be really sure that it's secure because we, yeah. I mean, that could really scale up. That's another thing. Their trade limits will be another topic because, yeah, the arbitrator doesn't take much risk as an mediator and probably there are no much reasons why to have small trade limits anymore. I mean, there might be other reasons when we think further, but from the security point of view, it's a very different game. So it might be much more reasonable to have really bigger trades also where people are selling 5-bit, 10 Bitcoin, whatever. And okay, so uh, you, you said you said it's, al al it's basically already ready. So... No, I don't think, I think that the core protocol needs more time because when we make a mistake there and we see we, yeah, we, yes, of there is some security or privacy issue, then we get fucked up and th then it's related to the DAO and BSQ because BSQ will become the central element here. <clears throat> when somebody managed to hack it and steal money or whatever, it has a direct influence on the DAO and the BSQ and also this analyzes what it means for the BSQ ecosystem and economy need to be done because it changed. The PSQ system was not designed for being a security model for trading. It was designed for contributors to get paid by working on BISC. And now we are mixing it with a second use case, which will be, I mean, the amount what, when, when all traders will move to there and use it for trading. I mean, we had 25 million volume the last month on, on, on Monero mostly. <coughs> So when they would like to use PSQ, they need to buy a lot of PSQ to, to cover this. So it will be a completely different economy now. It's basically only the traders for the trading fee, which are tiny amounts. And then there would be a huge demand on PSQ. So we get very different new circumstances with volatility with, and then attacks with volatility or whatever. So it needs a lot of more thought and analysis. And it's not 100% clear. Maybe we come to the conclusion it's not a good idea. We cannot do it safely or, uh, or in a privacy protecting way or it uh, creates too much risk for the DAO. And before we are there, that we are really sure wouldn't make sense. I mean, the implementation itself, I said, I think when I would work full time on it, the whole in a kind of like quick and dirty way without doing other improvements, I could do it maybe in one or two months. It's not such a big effort. But yeah, I of course, implementation we... is always uh, the, the smallest part. If you know what you, you want to do and how it works, then it, implementation is, is quite a smaller part. Yeah. Uh, but uh, to re, re, uh, rephrase the question, you, you said earlier, well, the, the new trade protocol uh, is available basically Yeah, that's for... with the next release, the version yeah. 1.2. Yeah. yeah. And uh, how long do you believe uh, should we stay with the 1.2 uh, version until uh, such a vastly different approach on the whole topic is, is yeah, I think for, <laughs> for the users? I mean, we have, that's a basic thing. We should be very aware what's our priorities, what's our vulnerabilities and work on this because um, we don't have unlimited time. <laughs> and a major other topic will be DDoS protection additional. Yeah, of course. We have our priorities, what we have to work on. And this, I mean, BISC works with this current trade protocol. Mining fees are not a problem at the moment. So we are not in a rush that we need this version two in the next three months. But we should keep it in a, in a quite high priority, but it will need its time and, and pace to, yeah, to get to a really solid solution there. 
So I would say let's keep it as a medium priority project in the background and anybody who has competence in this uh, conceptually work and this analysis should help us to get uh, more close to a solution. But in, we shouldn't just uh, put our 100% priority on that and forget all, all the rest. I mean, we could do it, but the, the decision when we really want to do this, okay, then let's say focus 100% on this, but yeah, we, we need the time to get this core protocol really solid. And as soon as so, we have the solid, we can make it a priority because it doesn't make sense. And that's one reason, like with the APIs, I'm not following too much their issues there. <clears throat> But when we put a lot of effort now on the API and a lot of complexities to represent the current trade protocol with the API, and then maybe in three months, in the best case, we would have version two and version one will die off, then all this work is for nothing. And the new API, as the well, version two, the API will be very different and much more simple because there, yeah, all the security issues are gone and you just have a few, I received the money, I confirmed to the contract and and I open a dispute, a few button clicks basically, which are in exchange with the trade peer. And all the complex stuff is done by the protocol itself that will not be part of the API probably. And so it's, we have to keep this in mind and the same with this Monero wallet integration. Uh, yeah, when we integrate this now and it costs us a lot of effort and money and and then with version two, we don't want to start to integrate wallets again because that's a goal to get rid of the wallets, to reduce this vulnerability. And there will maybe some solutions when people really want it, they're, they're installing maybe some whatever tool and then they are connecting their wallets. But when they get hacked, it's their responsibility. It's basically outside of BISC scope. We should just limit our liability because uh, software is insecure and we cannot, uh, yeah, we, we should limit it to our core business and not trying to be a wallet provider. So basically, if we say uh, that the uh, BISC version two is about, is, is something early next year, is a, is a reasonable time frame. <coughs> Look, it all depends on the contributors. I mean- <coughs> Of course, of course. The new trade protocol the idea is out since nearly two years and I had once hired and paid from my pocket, a developer start working on it and it didn't get anywhere. And now it was implemented in yeah, in one month. Welcome when people are source. working with full speed on it, it can be done all very quickly. And when nobody's working on it, it takes five years. It depends all on contribution and on, on the people yeah, who know how to do it, of course. Uh, but I mean, one thing what I didn't cover here <coughs> is, <coughs> but we don't have enough time, but it's actually, it's not really rocket science. Like this new trade protocol, I mean, it does, the implementation, it's, it's a step, it's, it's a, I call it task runner. There are separ several tasks doing several stuff like verifying a message, doing verification of the peer or whatever, and then creating a transaction, sending a message to the other peer, and then you have a listener where you wait for the expected message from the peer again. It's not really rocket science, it's just code at the end. And it's was not sure. For the one who has written it, it's much easier, but it could be done by any developer who is experienced Java yeah, developer. If, if the specification is, is clear, then... Yeah, but also the specification, I mean, <clears throat> to think about this, uh, of course, I mean, to be creative with finding the solution sets, not everybody can do this, and that's something more difficult, like also with this new trade protocol, to find this, yeah, to find a really good solution, that's the difficult thing. Yeah, and, uh, not. Not everybody has the talent for this and the knowledge about all the stuff. Uh, but the implementation, um, it's not rocket science. It's not uh, like creating Lightning Network or creating uh, whatever. It's, it's pure engineering. Uh, and of course, people need to know how the peer-to-peer -peer network works and what other features and what we can do and how to use our Bitcoin service classes to create the transaction, but the code is all there and you read the code and you understand it. It's not that difficult. But we are currently, we get stuck a little bit that, uh, yeah, I see a lot of progress in many small things and that's good as well to fix small issues there and there, but all the important stuff are not really moving forward since many, uh, too long. And uh, we need to, to solve this bottlenecks because those are the really vulnerabilities and it doesn't help us to have here small improvements when yeah, when biscuit uh, stay vulnerable on, on core issues and we are not moving 
to solutions in that area. Okay, thank you for the presentation on the on the BISC version two. Um, are there any questions from the from the audience? Yes, Ian, please go forward. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Ian. Um, <clears throat> I guess uh, it's. I mean, it's an interesting. Um, trade protocol and I, I'd, I'd have to think about it some more, but my first objection would be that I just, I don't see how it could function basic at, at any scale. If we look at the, let's say the person who's um, using uh, their, you know, United States bank account to buy a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin. Um, so they're going to have to buy a hundred dollars worth of BISC to buy that hundred dollars of Bitcoin, then purchase the Bitcoin. And then they have this BISC bond that they need to then, I mean, they could keep, save it for later if they plan to um, purchase in the future. But, you know, let's say this was just a one-off trade, they would need to now liquidate that BISC bond and <clears throat> into, the, you know, a, a future BISC market. And even like for someone like me, who's, let's say, right now I have a lot of offers locked up in various, you know, in US dollars and in uh, ruble and in Monero. Maybe it would make sense for me to have this BISC bond because I'm trading quite regularly. And as soon as I sell one offer, I can, you know, <clears throat> basically reuse my BISC bond to open a new one. But even at that scale, it suddenly doesn't make a ton of sense for me to, let's say, keep uh, one Bitcoin worth of BISC in addition to, you know, the trading capital that I would need to kind of facilitate the other orders. So I think, anyway, um, my yeah. point was kind of, yeah. I mean, yeah, <clears throat> it's, uh, I, I mean, you have there, you have basically three options. Either you use centralized exchanges where you, yeah, have zero privacy <clears throat> and full KYC and everything, and you're completely exposed to political or circumstances when they change, and maybe your Bitcoin get confiscated or they come to you and know that you have traded this Bitcoin and whatever. At when time are changing. So, I mean, you're exposed to certain risk in future, what nobody knows and nobody can estimate how they will be. Uh, those people who are not feeling very comfortable with this, they are usually looking for alternatives. And the only alternative, I think, at least on the fiat side, is currently BISC. And then you have the current trade protocol where you have all these problems, what I explained, with convenience. And, and then there is this new idea, and maybe there are new other better ideas, but nobody has found it yet, or I'm not aware. And it has also its costs. Like I said, yeah, this 100% security deposit is a friction and will not work for everybody. And a one-time trader who only wants to buy Bitcoin and then not use it anymore, maybe it's too much effort and he go to Coinbase or whatever, or go to a meetup and buy it in face-to-face -face or to an ATM. There are other options. It's not for everybody, not for every use case, but I think for our users, who are regularly trading, who care about privacy, they get <coughs> solved a lot of the problem. I mean, privacy is not very good in BISC when you look a little bit closer. Like when you are not really taking care to isolate every trade with using a coin chain in between and using external wallets and so on, everything is linked in the transactions. I mean, with simple block analysis, you can see that was one trader who did 20 transactions. And that's not really solvable because that's the problem of Bitcoin. In Monero, you wouldn't have this, but in Bitcoin, yeah, you don't have privacy on chain when uh, it's only if you don't reveal your identity. But with a fiat trade, you're revealing your identity, and then this trader knows you have done 20 other trades and maybe a rich guy or whatever. It's also a security issue. So it's a trade off. I mean, the current trade protocol it works and so on, but it has a lot of problems and disadvantages. <laughs> and friction, and we never can compete in many areas with uh, experience, with user experience of centralized exchanges. And with the new trade, with this version two off-chain trade protocol, we get a lot of this problem solved. And yeah, it, a big disadvantage will be that it's basically 100% security deposit, which is locked up for a long time, because um, it, uh, when you make a bank charge back, it can happen three weeks or four weeks later as well. And we need to protect against this. So, and that's another thing. We can support more risky payment methods because when you use PayPal and you make a chargeback after three weeks, yeah, your bond is still gone because it's locked up for three months. But of course, the, the cost is that people need to do it. And it, 
it's an open question. Maybe we find out nobody's interest because nobody wants to do it. But then they basically shouldn't complain that uh, about the current problems. And yeah, it's it's a maybe it's an important part of our research before really working on it to get a little bit more user feedback and see if they would accept it when they really understand it. I mean, the first thing is people are skeptical with everything new, and Biscuit took a long time until they trusted and used the system because it was new and different. And, uh, yeah. Oh, well, I, I think that's a great answer. I mean, first, just speaking to the, the point that it's not going to be everything for everybody, um, that, that's very reasonable. It's, you know, it has a, kind of specific narrow use cases and you're trying to address those people that are unaddressed by other, you know, products. And I mean, <clears throat> there's another big uh, thing what we have to keep in mind. I mean, future is moving away from fiat or from cash at least. <clears throat> and I wouldn't be surprised when at the next big currency exchanges, all the governments introduce digital currencies and there's no cash anymore. And the digital currency will be likely, even if it's a government, uh, as it will be governmental centralized digital currencies, uh, it's much more closer to altcoins or to stable coins like the current fiat system. So there might be a chance that basically in future we are uh, we have <clears throat> yeah we have ways. Or another option can be that the stable coins become more more important as replacement for fiat, and most people don't need the traditional fiat anymore with all the big problems. And then you have basically on altcoin siding uh, ecosystem or infrastructure where where it's a different playing field. Uh, you, I mean, a big the problem what BISC always wanted to solve and the big challenge was to deal with fiat and with banks. And they are, yeah, they don't provide interfaces. You cannot automate stuff and all these problems. You don't have any cryptographic security. When you're on pure altcoin side trading, you are basically competing with platforms like Monero or Bitches or all these platforms who are who, who have <coughs> uh, tokenized other currencies on their platform and then you trade Ethereum against Ethereum at the end, also contracts against contracts. And in BSQ and Bitcoin is basically the same. I mean, when you are trading Bitcoin to BSQ, it's uh, yeah, that's why we can make this trustless, secure atomic transaction. <laughs> Uh, and when we would have basically a color coin for all the other assets like dollar or euro or Monero and then have a Bitcoin based color coin for this, we could only work with such trustless uh, atomic transactions. That might be another direction where we could be a uh, goal which would be even much superior. But here you have the problem why should people convert their Monero to a BISC? Uh, color coin Monero or the dollar and then how to do the backing and all this. There are some ideas. It's not completely out of, uh, but the big problem is that you are then competing with the big players who have already built this market and infrastructure like Ethereum mainly. And it, there's not a good chance that you can win against this. But who knows, maybe the future is that everybody use <coughs> tokens on either Monero, uh, uh, Ethereum or use tokens on on, uh, on side chains like uh, <coughs> uh, no. what's called from Blockstream the um, liquid liquid. <coughs> Who knows where the future lies? I mean, and then maybe the current BISC model is obsolete because they are just superior, and we cannot compete because they are already too far ahead. But it's I mean they they have the other problems. Yeah, how you do this packing and um, there's no, I have not seen any trustless censorship resistant solution for, yeah, for doing this tokenization and you don't want to trust another Fed who is basically issuing Tether or who is, uh, and yeah, Blockstream is maybe the most promising, but there it's still not decentralized and not censorship resistant. So, and it's an American company. When it becomes big, then they get, they get KYC and get under pressure like any other big company. So, mm -hmm. It's, it's an open field. It, we, are, we are on an on a innovation front where nobody knows how, it, what will be, how tomorrow will look like. Yes. And I think we have to make experiments and we shouldn't assume that this trade protocol will be now the solution for the next 20 years. I mean, we are experimenting and hopefully we can help to find out something which might be a feasible long-term solution, but maybe not.
Yeah, I mean, at least for at least right now in the U.S. dollar market, there's a 50% security deposit uh, if you are. Really? I forget if it's your buyer or the seller, but one of them, um, and a 10% security deposit on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's not crazy to. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Not a buyer who can do theoretically a chargeback. He's exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's not crazy to me to up that to 100. percent But could you talk about how you f would envision the BSQ market? Because I've been trading in that, and um, I just can't. I mean, I, I might not have a big imagination, but I can't imagine how. Um, yeah, I mean, it that would be could grow that would handle the you know handle any reasonable amount of trading volume. Why not? I mean, it's a set that would that it could be done already now. This conversion that basically. <coughs> trading BSQ will not be like now a manual process. You're just clicking. I mean, there will be still offers, but you take the best offers. You want to convert one Bitcoin to BSQ. You take the first three offers with the best price. You see then the, the total price of your conversion rate. You click the button. You're executing those offers as you are exchanging with. You're making these atomic transactions. And after the next blockchain, you have the BSQ. And with that, I don't see any scalability issues. <clears throat> the demand model and the economic model will be very different now. It's the, the traders who need BSQ trading fee to get the cheaper fee who are their primary demand creation. I mean, additionally, of course, there can be speculators who want to invest in, who believe that the BSQ price will be higher and start to buy BSQ. But so far, we have not seen much of this. So I think the market is 90% driven by traders and we are burning roughly I think 50,000, 60, 80,000 BSQ per month and that's not bad but it's uh, it's not a huge demand. We are also issuing last month was 100,000 BSQ. I mean that was a little bit more like usually but in average we have also 60, 70,000 uh, BSQ what we issue per month so it's more or less break even <coughs> but it doesn't create over demand. Uh, on uh, on the on the buy side or on the yeah well, depending what you see now uh, <coughs> when people it's need pretty to well buy, balanced yeah at the, at the balanced, moment yeah and that's probably a reason why it's pretty much on the one dollar it's like a stable coin uh, yeah. surprisingly but I think it's just contributors get basically this promise with one dollar so they don't sell lower usually and and so it floats around this one dollar. But when, they're, when traders need to buy a BSQ for bonding, the demand will be much, much higher because yeah, when you're trading whatever 10 Bitcoin in parallel, you need, yeah, you need uh, the amount of 100,000 BSQ. And that's just one trader. So it yeah, can be- but that's just once. Yeah, that's just once, that's true. But um, yeah, but basically, <clears throat> uh, I mean, I think it will, in, and th all those are just open issues that we need to analyze to get some model and ideas how it will behave. When we started, there might be, depending how fast it starts, but there might be a huge increase of price. And then when it's settled, then the, there's not much demand and the price might crash and we don't want to have high volatility. It's not good for the system. So all these things uh, need to be analyzed and uh, taken in consideration what are the risks. I think as long as uh, the market is growing, <coughs> Uh, yeah, when we get new users, they need to buy new bonds, so the price will go up again. When people are leaving, then basically the price would go down because they are unlocking their bond and it will take a few months. It, I think it has a stabilizing uh, factor when there would be some whatever small event, we had a big bug and people are leaving immediately and want to unlock their bond. The effect will be only visible in three or four months and basically people cannot, they are locked in in the system for a few months. And that's good for the stability of BSQ, maybe not so good for the traders because they cannot react so quickly. They cannot liquidate their BSQ. They're taking basically some risk. Uh, and yeah, it's, it has its own properties and need to be analyzed from all these aspects. I, and it's hard to say, I'm not 100% comfortable. <clears throat> I think for the BSQ price, it will be very bullish and good, but for stability and the risk for the DAO, it might be a danger. And I don't want, I think, we shouldn't put the DAO on risk that it can fail because of a secondary use case, which could crash the market and then nobody will work on BISC anymore because yeah, the BSQ is too volatile that nobody would accept it. Then we would have killed our primary use case. 
to implement or to yeah, buy secondary use case. So we have to be careful. Yeah, because I really, I, I really like the current use case where the fees, <clears throat> basically getting a, a discount on your fees is then going and getting burned up, you know, in, in a proportion to the amount that's being released to the developers to pay for, you know, all the, the costs yeah. of running the, but I, I just, I, I can see that the, like my best guess on how BSQ would behave in an, in a an market where everyone needed to have a 100% security deposit is that it would, you know, um, the price could rise very rapidly as people are coming in. And like you said, if something changed where people all wanted to get out, you know, you just, you're going to have a, I, I would just, I would expect extreme volatility. Yeah. That's what I would expect. So, it would be for sure higher. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it depends on the growth rate. We we generally have the philosophy we want to grow organically and not in yeah with huge events or whatever. And we did this as well. So, I mean, in BISC, it was growing slowly organically, and I think that's healthy. And also with BSQ, it's the same. We didn't attract speculators. The price was not going up like crazy and then crashing like with other when not uh, altcoin is issued you. Actually, you see a huge spike and then it crashed down and then it takes long for recovering. <coughs> uh, we, all, yeah, we didn't have this, basically. Uh, so it's all good signs that we can deal well with organic growth. And automatically, because this new protocol will be very new and people will not trust it, it will be hard to convince people to use it. So we'll not be very likely that immediately 80% of the users switch over in one month and then create a huge spike. More likely that it takes maybe a year until we get... 50 or 70 percent of the users converted and then it's already organically enough that it doesn't create too much volatility but never nobody knows and it it's some risk and as said uh, the security <clears throat> from economic attacks or risks on BSQ I think is quite high in the current model and it will be higher risk I assume with the new model because there could be there could be certain complex attack scenarios where you are you're doing a lot of trades and you're crashing the market and then you can basically abuse overuse your bond because uh, you have open trades but they are not really covered anymore and maybe you are scamming than the other trader whatever it can be all kind of weird scenarios what we have to think about even if they are unlikely and which could yeah to try to manipulate the price could become some issue and it's at the moment there is nearly no issue or no big risk for this but uh, there are a few as well as a contributor you could try to crash the market to get a higher bsq compensation request and later yeah but it's all we have a long-term three months average and all this so it's very unlikely that this happens but with this new model yeah it's just new scenario and we have to think very carefully about all this Okay, so summing up, I believe, uh, if I understand that correctly, the, the, the new trade protocol is here to stay. It solves a lot of problems regarding the arbitration and so on. Uh, the BISC version 2 is something that uh, we want to launch to kind of try something new. And maybe if it works, get rid of some issues we have with the current model. But uh, basically, we just try something new, see if it works, see if, if people accept it, uh, but keep the, the old one, so the new trade protocol in this, in this case, uh, for a pretty long time and not turn it off uh, immediately would, after the new version. I would make it dependent on this analyzing and on the finding a solid solution where we are happy with the uh, bonding protocol. <coughs> when we have both solved, which could be done in, in one month or one week when we have people working on this but currently nobody's working on this so it's yeah it's, that's those are the bottlenecks basically when we have a team working on this and really competent and making this and we get to the solution the risks are low enough that we want to go for it and we have a solid solution for this it could be implemented in the best case in two months or three months and we could really move over in the next half year but with the current resources, it's unlikely that we have this situation. I'm not really referring to how long it takes to implement it, but uh, for for users to get uh, com uh, get get uh, uh, get uh, the idea and get comfortable with with having this kind of of trading uh, prerequisites yeah. and and stuff like this. It made you said it yourself. It took a long time. 
for the uh, current BISC DAO to be somewhat accepted or understood uh, how it works and, and what it is there for. And uh, it, with a, such a such a, a big change, that it might <laughs> yeah, take users it, a long time to, to uh, understand yeah. the benefits. But you know, I mean, now we have not spent much time at all on this new idea and just by working on it, we can find maybe much, much better solutions. Like, I mean, <clears throat> yesterday I come up with this new idea that the arbitrator can do, can play this role of the bond uh, dealer who is buying your bond basically and then we are resolving all this, a lot of the problems and improving a lot of the concept. So maybe when somebody works on this, he finds a very good idea that this is not an issue anymore. And like, for instance, having a market for this, that the bond is, you can provide, yeah, you, are, uh, you have a reputation online on Twitter and everybody knows you and trusts you and then your bond is much, much lower because it's delegated to a kind of like a marketplace where people are paying your bond and taking the risk because they trust you and you pay some fee for this or whatever and then suddenly that's not an issue anymore because say, yeah, I'm a famous guy on Twitter, everybody trusts me. So I get very cheap in this new model and I don't care and I only get the benefits. So I would not, yeah, I said, I think like in BISC everything, uh, the resources and the contributors, that's our, our bottleneck. When we have enough people working on all this stuff, we can, we can move mountains, but uh, we're not there and that's where yeah, we... Yeah, welcome to open source. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, I mean, we have the big benefit now, we have the DAO. I mean, all these other open source projects, you don't get paid, you, yeah, you only have the altruistic motivation. And now we yes, have the BISC DAO and people are getting paid real money and you can trade yes, it, you yes, can yes, sell course. it. So uh, we should, uh, yeah, we um, probably we have to make more PR still that we're attracting more people and find the people who can implement and, and uh, realize these yeah. ideas. As I already said, I do not see the issue with implementing it. I see the issue with designing it. And uh, the second step, of course, what Ian already, already said, uh, that people actually start using the stuff because yeah. it's so much different than BISC is now. Uh, and and if, we, if we move, maybe if we move too quickly, we can uh, sure. kill, kill BISC as yeah. it is now. So. No, no, sure, we have to take care and, yeah. And I said it's planned anyway as a parallel road in the worst case, we implemented it and nobody used it. Then, okay, yeah. it was a failed investment. Uh, but we should be careful and be w very aware of this possible outcome to avoid that it will happen. So to do everything that we are making it smooth enough for conversion that people are really using it as well. But I see this, all this thinking as part of implementation or the first step yeah, we need to do all this mental thinking about it to get really a solid model analysis and everything before getting to code and so And that requires resources as well. And, uh, and of course, those qualities are less widely deployed like coding uh, competi uh, competence. Uh, but yeah, we have to find the right people who have talent for work on such stuff. Okay, so thank you everybody for the presentation on BISC version 2. Uh, are there still any questions for the BISC version 2 uh, part from the audience? If not, I will, uh, yeah, let's, let's close this dev call. Uh, short summary, we talked about, we talked about the uh, current issues with arbitration and, and the ethics surface arbitration. Uh, provides in the current uh, implementation of BISC. Uh, the new trade protocol is there to uh, get rid of this, uh, of this weakness of the arbitration uh, role. Uh, it, it does not get ri rid of the arbitration role by itself, but it changes the role in a drastic way so that we don't have the same ethics service anymore. So the new trade protocol is about uh, getting rid of some risks, but don't really change the way BISC's wor BISC works and uh, the, the trading and all of this is going to stay the same. Uh, BISC version 2 is uh, a whole other issue. Uh, the, 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 the BISC version 2 is basically, yeah, is, is a, a more general marketplace. Uh, and it changes the behavior of trades and so on for the user. Uh, 
and it is or also difficult for uh, for onboarding of new users because it's it costs twice the the amount it costs with uh, current um, the current BISC version. Uh, anyway, the BISC version two is is uh, already there in our minds. It is not there. Uh, it's not implemented yet, um, and it is more of a of a of a of a, a way to to try out new stuff and if it works it's very good and then we can move maybe in a half a year in a year or so to the BISC version 2 if we don't if it don't uh, succeed very well we tried at least we tried um, and basically uh, that is that is it yes um, as always the recording of this dev core will be available uh, on YouTube, uh, I will, I will uh, do some uh, create some meeting minutes. Uh, however, I will keep this more because uh, there are a lot of proposals out there with all the technical details we talked about today, and you can read up uh, a more complete picture there. I will post the links, of course. Um, yeah, and that is it. A small note: I will uh, there will not be a dev call in the upcoming uh, three weeks or so because I'm on vacation. If someone else does some dev course, I don't know. I will not do any dev course. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Thanks for joining and have a nice day. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.